and we are live. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Connected Learning TV. Uh, this is the second webinar in a month-long series titled Equity and Learning in the 21st Century Classroom, colon, Explore, Connect, and Transform. It's a very long title. Uh, my name is Ontario Garcia, and I'm going to be our host for today. Uh, throughout April, we've been talking with editors and contributors to the new ebook, uh, Teaching in the Connected Learning Classroom. Um, it's free. You should go find it and download it and read it and enjoy it, and enjoy it a lot. Uh, as well as teachers and researchers who can connect and speak about connected learning in schools and out of school spaces. Um, today, we're going to be talking with several editors, contributors, and a reviewer of the ebook about how schools can take advantage of digital networking opportunities connect to connect their students to each other and to the larger community outside the four walls of the schools. Um, before we dive into the chat, though, let's just do some quick housekeeping. Um, for those participating, per, uh, participating, this is not a good start, is it? Um, for those participating on live stream right now, please use the chat there to introduce yourself, connect with each other, and ask questions. We'll be able to address those uh, here in the Google Hangout if you're asking questions over there. Um, we're also chatting throughout the month in the Connected Learning Google Plus community and via the hashtag Connected Learning on Twitter. Um, so for those links should be in live stream chat, and I hope you join us there. Um, in order for us to dive in this conversation, I want to connect to what we did last week, where we've been using a hashtag um, where we learn to describe different learning spaces for us. So I'm just going to go from left to right on my screen and start with Bud and just ask you to introduce yourself and tell us where you learn. So welcome, Bud. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'm Bud Hunt. I'm an instructional technology coordinator in uh, northern Colorado with the St. Mary Valley School District and uh, one of the... Uh, editors of the of the ebook. Um, where I learn is uh, pretty much anywhere I have an internet connection or a large cup of coffee, a uh, good book to read. Uh, or today I'm learning in a beige box. Uh, I'll show you real quick. This is our secret soundproof room in my shared cubicle facility. We call it the Cubidrome. So I learn in the Cubidrome. Thanks, bud. Secret soundproof box. Carlos and Jacob, do you have a secret soundproof box? Uh, I wish I did. It'd be, it'd be pretty cool to have one. Um, <laughs> um, I'm Jacob. I'm a learner here at NTHC. Um, and um, <laughs> currently, we're learning in a in a little office closet type uh, place here. It's uh, it's it's pretty it's pretty neat. But yeah, we're we're both learners here at uh, New Tech as well. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Janelle. So I am Janelle Bentz, and I have the privilege of uh, being a facilitator for these learners. I facilitate at New Tech High at Coppell, and I am their English One facilitator as part of a blended humanities course entitled Global Issues. Thanks, Janelle. Uh, mm -hmm. Joanna and Taylor? So I'm Johanna. And this is Taylor, and we obviously uh, also learn here at New Tech High. But I mean, we're in the same place as Carlos mm -hmm. and Jacob. <laughs> and you sort of just learn everywhere, no matter where you are, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. And Justin. Great. My name is Justin Reich. Uh, I'm a researcher with HarvardX, and I also uh, co-founded a professional learning group called Ed Tech Teacher. The, the most uh, fun place that I have been learning recently is that there's a new rock climbing gym that opened up in Somerville that has a co-learning, like co-working, co-learning space built on top of it. Um, so you can imagine, like there are these sort of rock climbing walls that you can go climb up and down and get some exercise, and then kind of like behind one of those walls is a big, long area with a bunch of tables and a bunch of standing desks. And so it is now not uncommon for me to um, go to the gym when it opens and do a little working out and then go and work out my brain and learn a little bit. And then sometimes when I'm really motivated, I do, I do double sessions and climb again in the afternoon. But that's my new favorite place to learn. Well, that's awesome, Justin. Um, one of the places that I've been learning, I've had my um, college students here in Colorado State uh, make zines this past week, and they've been drop lifting them all around Fort Collins and putting them in stacks of libraries and at the Walmart. Um, so I've been having my students think about learning as uh, in community spaces by drop lifting and secretly. Drop lifting is the opposite of shoplifting, by the way, where you put magazines and different things in spaces for people to discover. Um, which I think will bring us into thinking about what are open digital networks. So 
Uh, as, as we talk for the rest of the hour today, I really want us to unpack what do open digital networks mean for schools, what does it mean for those watching this in terms of how we can connect within schools and with each other. Um, so I want to start with that, with a very general question then of what do we mean by open digital networks. And I'd like to hear from everybody, but I'm, I think I'm going to ask you, Bud, as the person who curated this chapter of the book, um, to help us unpack this definition to start. Sure. Um, so uh, at, at its simplest, open networks are networks that people can find and that people can access and that people can contribute to. So when I think about open networks, I think uh, the web is a, is a delightful example of an open network, but it's not the only one. Um, I think a lot of the places where I hang out uh, uh, in, in public spaces are possibly open networks, just, just spaces that people can get to, can discover, and, and then can, can collaborate and share across. So in the, in, the, um, in the book, I talk a little bit about some of my habits as an openly networked person, but uh, when I think about um, uh, Twitter as a place that could be an open network in many ways, um, my uh, my blog is an open network in the sense that I have comments open and folks can drop by, uh, but but to me an open network is, is one, it's important to think about it open as I can participate in it, but open in the sense that I can also discover it and, and participate in a variety of ways. Thanks, bud. Any other people, anyone else have uh, thoughts on what open digital networks means to you? Justin? Yeah, so I would say another really critical piece um, is that there are no barriers to entry. That's, I, I mean, open's a great word and a great word to think about a whole bunch. So, um, you know, Bud mentioned that uh, it was something that you could find, that it was accessible, that it was participatory, that it's something that, like, theoretically you can contribute to. <clears throat> I, think, I think no barriers to entry is another piece of what we often mean when we mean open is that um, you can be a five-year-old, you can be a 55-year-old, you can be a 105-year-old, you can have any kind of degree, you can do anything else that you, you know, you can have any kind of background and be able to join in, a, in an open conversation. Thanks, Justin. Janelle, do you have a thoughts on this? Yeah, I was thinking for us in our um, learning experiences, that openly that open network and having um, the ability to communicate and publish our work outside of our four walls has really been been important to really add authenticity to our learning, um, and I think that's one of the reasons why our kids here have really thrived. Um, openly networked means being very transparent about showing your work, your learning, um, and everything that comes with it. So I that's why I asked these guys to come in and uh, maybe Taylor. Do you have something to speak to that? Um, yes. So to me, openly networked means that the learners, not just from your school and in your four walls, can contribute and you can debate and have discussions and learn together with people from across the country or even across the world. I love that. Thanks. Um, one thing I want to think about, and, and picking up on, on that and picking up on what Janelle was saying, is thinking about why is the idea of networking so powerful within education right now. In particular, I think these ideas of open and network seem almost like scary words for today's, um, the way we talk about education today. Um, so I'm curious, why is this such an important moment for open networking um, in public education in schools today? Um, and this can go to anybody who wants to start us off here. Um, well, I, I think that, like, today, like, especially in this, like, new, like, technological era, I guess, it's, it's very important to have open network uh, learning because you, we, we, have, we have a network of computers literally called, like, the Internet, you know, where you can connect through and from anywhere to everywhere, you know, so it's, I think it's really important to have that in, uh, in public schools because then you have differing opinions based on, you know, points of views from everywhere else. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I appreciate you mentioning the internet and computers because one of the things that's great about uh, computing environments is that they allow us, I think, to see uh, some of the things we take for granted offline about our networks and, and the situations that we find ourselves in. Um, I wonder about a lot of classrooms that really aren't all that open uh, for students or, or the uh, or the people who might uh, wander by and discover it. Um, but I do think about relationships that I have that are, are my networks of people that are very open, um, that, you know, uh, you can think about this in, in social situations. Are you the type of guy who goes to, to dinner with eight or ten folks who would invite the people at the next table to join you? Uh, or are you the type of person that 
that goes to the private room and sits alone. Um, the, 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 the thing that is happening in schools with our physical environments a lot of times is we're locking stuff down, we're closing things off, um, but the internet is giving us this great opportunity to open things beyond and, and still feel safe. Um, of course, there's a lot of, of unsafety stuff to wonder about too, but I'm curious as to how uh, our digital environments can help us think about how to create open physical spaces in our schools and in our classrooms. Bud yeah. Hunt says, don't eat dinner alone. Um, sorry, Janelle. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's what's so interesting is that that same technology that can make people um, Isolated, which is one of the reasons why technology sometimes gets a bad rap, is people just, you know, stay there with the technology. Um, but for us in education, we were really trying to see it as an opportunity to get gain those extra perspectives and those new um, opinions and really learn from one another. Um, we're a rather homogeneous population here at New Tech at Coppell, so to be able to reach out to schools across the country really, really help us to construct meaning of current events or whatever issues are being raised and we discuss. Again, I also think that it's important to allow our learners and challenge them to say, hey, what is it like to um, have the opportunity and the challenge to really communicate um, with different people who have differing opinions, different beliefs, and what does that look like, not only face-to-face, -face, but also with these openly networked classrooms, what does it look like online? Because that's something that we're constantly going to have to teach, well, everyone's going to have to learn, what is my online identity going to look like, how do I need to negotiate um, these, the civic discourse, and how is that going to shape my beliefs as well? And Johanna, I think you had some thoughts around this too, did you want to speak here? Yeah, okay. she has something and then I'll add. Yeah, um, well one of the things you can do with technology is gain the perspectives like Ms. Spence said, but if you're just inside your four walls in your school, you may only get one side of the story and that can form your opinion one way, but if you're able to connect with people outside of that, then that can totally shape your opinion a completely different way and open your eyes and enrich your learning. Right, that's kind of what I was going to touch on, how like, whenever you learn the opinion of other people you also sort of see their standpoint on it and you see like why it's important to them and then it can also like alter your point on it too. And Justin, I know you've been looking at this work um, in, in various spaces um, both at higher ed and, and in MOOCs and I'm wondering if you can speak to some of your experiences with this in terms of why are open digital networks so important in terms of the work you've been doing. Yeah, so I think most of us think about the learning environments that have, the learning experiences that we've had that have been most powerful for us. Um, they have a few characteristics. They were something that was important and meaningful for us. Usually they're something where we feel like we made a personal connection with another human being, so they were social in nature. Um, and then oftentimes they were participatory learning experiences. So when you, we ask people to talk about the most powerful learning experiences they had, there are a few, but very few people will say, my gosh, I was sitting there listening to this person, and when he got to the 75th minute of what he was talking about, like, wow, that really is what struck me. Um, you know, most people will talk about apprenticeships, they'll talk about opportunities to participate, they'll talk about opportunities to contribute. Um, you know, I guess one of my concerns with as we sort of think about expanding online opportunities in higher education is that we'll mostly expand these models where there's one talking head talking broadly out to the world, you know, and there's some great things to learn from bright, thoughtful people who have things to say, but I don't think those are going to reproduce our most powerful learning experiences. The most powerful learning experiences people talk about are ones that are in conversation and in dialogue with one another. Um, and so that's what I'm most excited about for dividing open learning networks that can allow people to be in conversation and participating in learning experiences when, with one another. Um, and we can recognize that in, in you know, many of the domains that we ask people to learn about, um, there are a lot of different perspectives, as, uh, you know, as, as Jenna and Taylor were talking about, and, there's, and, and exploring those perspectives is central to what learning means and what learning looks like. Um, and ulti you know, so I'm interested in, in how do we create spaces um, both in higher education, in K-12, and maybe even more importantly, you know, most, most of those kinds of distinctions, 
exist because as we were organizing people for industrial schooling 100 years ago, it made sense to make these age-graded classrooms. Um, but I'm really excited about places that say, all right, you know, regardless of how old we are, you know, there are people in all these different environments who are trying to learn about this thing. Um, and so let's you know, ignore some of those barriers and see how we can learn together from, from, from all of us. Thanks, Justin. I like hearing even old people can be a part of uh, Open Even old networks. people can learn, too. That's my <laughs> point. <laughs> we've, got sure. some, we've got some good quotes coming out of today's webinar. I'm very yeah, excited. Yeah. Even old people can learn. BJFR. <laughs> um, I think, so, so knowing that even old people can learn, oh man, we're off to a great start today. Um, I, want us to, I want us to unpack a little bit and talk about what do these actually look like. So instead of, instead of talking about, instead of talking hypothetically, uh, I think the powerful part of, of the ebook we're working around is we're looking at real school examples. And Bud and I have started a conversation um, on DML Central really looking at um, the work he's doing in terms of um, supporting and sustaining open digital networks uh, in his school district. So, Bud, I'm wondering if you can talk about what this has looked like in your school context, and I also want to hear from the students as well after this. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll try to be brief, and you may need to stop me because this is what I do uh, most of the time. But I guess one of the things we've been doing in our district is, is big around access to networks. So uh, device distribution has been has been essential to our work these last couple of years is we've realized that we need folks to be able to interact and, and talk and argue and make things together and share those things. Um, the, the actual work of getting them onto the network is, is a piece of that work. Um, then we're building the infrastructures that allow for uh, networking to happen. And I guess I'd, I'd want to highlight too, um, the learning management system in our school district is a really powerful um, tool for allowing students and teachers to do the work of school in, in a networked environment. But I wouldn't say that that's necessarily an open environment. Uh, that's a closed classroom environment in a digital space. What we started to do with some of our professional development, though, is open up that closed network to anybody that wants to come into it. So we've thought very intentionally about how do you gain access to these resources, where should they live, who should be able to get to them, and what can they do once they get into the environment. So you have to think about the infrastructure and the permissions, and the it, it gets a little IT uh, pipes and wire geekery, but, but you have to think about who gets to come in, who gets to play, um, and, and where they get to. And, and then we also have some environments that we've decided will start open and, and we'll go that way. So we have a WordPress installation in our school district that allows us for that more um, open start to students sharing what they're doing at the end of the day, to teachers and, and, and the community and district departments sharing information that, that typically would be private, it's memo, it's, it's circular. But if we, if we surface some of that stuff and, and put public information into a public environment, we start to get the benefits of, um, of discovery, of serendipity, of, of exposure, of things that don't necessarily mash together, mashing together. Uh, so that's just a few. In the chapter, I, I would highlight just two more real quick. Um, Gail uh, Dessler's work on um, um, creating these rich pen pal relationships uh, between folks and experts who had these uh, these. Uh, very important experiences as well as the students who are learning about these experiences together. She uh, references some of that work. Um, but just this notion that, that students who are learning about the same thing in different places can, can talk about that thing. And in the, in the talking about the same experience that they're having in their individual classrooms, that can be really powerful learning. And, and if we can make that easy to do through digital tools, uh, she talks about VoiceThread a lot as a really powerful tool for that. Um, that, that can increase a, a sort of a very traditional learning situation, make it really, really engaging and interesting and, and powerful and live beyond the classroom. But can you talk a little bit about, so it sounds like there's been a lot of talking and implementing on, on your end, um, which is both IT and, and I think you said pipes and wire geekery. Mm -hmm. um, but in addition to that, can you, can you talk about the ways um, teachers, administration, parents are responding to this, in, in any, like the responses of the community in, in moving towards this direction? Yeah, we were talking with a parent group this morning, and um, one, of the, one of the concerns that, that parents have is, I don't want my kids exposed to networks beyond my house and my family. And that's a totally legitimate uh, uh, position. I, I'm not, I don't want to say that if, if a parent says they don't want to do the thing that the teacher says they should do, the parent's wrong. I just don't think that's accurate. Um, but there's, there's a, a sense that as we, as we expand the classroom, we also are expanding the parents' sphere of influence into the school. And so there's a really interesting uh, cultural uh, mishmash there. Uh, there's another fun quote for you, a cultural mishmash of wires and geekery. But um, in, terms of, in terms of our network, the, the school context, 
and the family context. And those are those are uh, juxtaposing and playing together nicely. Uh, that said, a, a lot of our teachers and, and are, are really appreciative of the opportunities to connect with their kids in non-traditional ways. They have access to them through the LMS and the blogging tools and the other online tools at, at odd hours. And so there's a, a re structuring of what it means to be uh, at work and at home or at school and at home uh, those are those are complicated messy things but um, in general our our students and our teachers have more opportunity to interact with each other with the families that they serve and with the other teachers and students in the same district uh, you know the the first thing that people think about when you think about open networks is the people on the other end of the country or the other end of the world who are totally different from them I'm really interested lately in how uh, open online networks can build um, social capital and can increase ties between people who are like two neighborhoods away who may have never interacted but could and can cement sort of an online relationship with that face-to-face -face interaction I think that's really important yeah, I think in my own experience, a lot of the, the networking stuff I did with my high school students in South Central Los Angeles, it was less about connecting them to the world, you know, to, to people in other states or in other countries. It was really about sustaining a network of peers within the same classroom or, or within, within, you know, across the hall. And I think in some ways those are even the, those are the more valuable networks that are often forgotten about when we talk about open digital networks. Mm -hmm. Carlos and Jacob, I'm, Jacob, I'm wondering if, if the two of you are willing to talk a little bit about um, what this has looked like in your school setting and, and the types of work that you're doing as students there? Right. Um, the digital, open digital, like, networking and, like, learning, it looks a lot like the uh, KQED Do Now discussions. Like, they'll pose a question on a current event, and basically people from, like, I don't know how many schools, you know, they go in there and they comment their, you know, opinions on the, on the uh, prompt and on the topic, and everything like that and you know they start discussions and debates and things like that and it's really cool because like um, over, you know because it's really cool because it's like you know over the internet and you don't you have like freedom to say like what you what you what you can say and you have the time to do it versus in a classroom setting where you might not have time or freedom to say what you need to say about you know a certain topic and whatnot. Can you tell us what the KQED uh, do nows are in case people don't know who are watching? Yeah. Okay, um, the KQD Do Nows are, is, um, it's a great way to come together and talk about, like, current events that are happening right now. Um, it's a great way to get informed about current events. Um, it's just, like, it's, it's fun, and it's not as, like, as boring as probably reading a news article because there are other people's opinions on there, and sometimes it can, uh, it's fun to debate about them, and it's just, it's... It gives everybody a chance to like share, ex share and express their own opinions on what they have about whatever topic it is that week. Thanks. Uh, Johanna and Taylor, did you want to jump in on this? Yeah. So on those topics and stuff, most of the time, like at New Tech High, we have usually every week we are assigned to do like an original post on them and then like reply to other people to like make the conversations more diverse and help other people I don't know but then they also usually include something that's extra credit for us which are on so many different things I can't even begin to name them and they really provide like extra to it mm -hmm. um, it's a weekly blog hosted by KQED out of San Francisco so we get to post about our opinions and hear from our peers in our classrooms as well and you kind of just get an insight onto everybody's opinion and you get to express your opinion in a way that means a lot to you. For example, like if you're into art, you could create a political cartoon on the topic and be able to express it that way. Right. So Joanna and Taylor, and I, since your teacher is totally not watching or even a part of this webinar right now, can you talk about why you think your teacher is using this work and the ways she's using open digital networks? Yeah, I mean, they usually, I don't know how they find them, but they find all these different, like, platforms for us. Like, we've made infographics before. We've made political cartoons. We've made these things called Zegas, which you, like, put together a bunch of words and pictures and stuff. And what else? And then we usually take those and we post it on the networks like Twitter or the KQED blog. That way it's shared with the public and everybody can view it. Do you like that uh, Ms. Benz makes you do this work? 
makes you sound so authoritative? I really enjoy the extra credit, actually, because they're a lot more creative, usually, and more, like, you can form them yourself, and you have more, uh, whatever it's called, more creative freedom. space. Yeah, I also really enjoy them because it's not just, like, you sit in your classroom and you discuss a side of the topic, and you kind of, like she said, you get more freedom, and it's more... I guess, an organic way to learn about the topics. It's not just like, you're going to do this, 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 and this. You really have the freedom to do what works best for you. That's great. Thanks for letting me interrogate you for a minute. Justin, jump in here. No, I just want to pick up on something I think really important that Joanna and Taylor were talking about. So they say, I really like the extra credit. Um, and I think that's something that we hear. And I didn't hear it as in, like, I really like the extra credit because I'm only getting a 69 right now. I need a 71. Um, I hear it in terms of here's this per here's this you know sort of nominally peripheral practice like it's peripheral because we're calling it extra credit it's not the main thing and I think we see that all the time in schools that the that the sites for the most interesting deeper learning are happening in extra credit in after school activities in electives in alternatives that somehow we've designed a school system where if we interrogate students they're telling us that the most powerful learning experiences they're having are on the periphery of what they're doing rather than at the core of what they're doing and I think we should be asking ourselves some really tough questions about that um, if if that's in fact the case you know why why have, why have we structured schools um, so that the experiences that students tell us are the most impactful and the most important to them are ones that they're squeezing in the margins of what they're doing, and most importantly, maybe they are not equitably distributed. Um, so, you know, kids who have who are more affluent, who have higher grade point averages, who have more support, have more time for these extra activities. Where kids who are having a harder time come from more challenging environments are stuck in these core places that we see are, are less viable. I mean, I think one sort of theme of a lot of this connected learning work is really trying to look at these practices that we hear, you know, as extra credit, as alternatives, as this thing that we do when the, you know, when we're done with the tests for the year, and really trying to figure out how do we make that more um, uh, central to, to what we're doing. I think that's a huge point. And Janelle, do you want to clarify this a bit? Yeah, so I think that, um what they're speaking of is that, yes, they do, on a weekly basis, we do ask them. It's part of the um, curriculum or content that we're teaching. They do participate in the do now part. Um, the extra credit, let's say, and the only reason why we kind of made it extra credit is the making portion of it because we really wanted to give them the freedom. And so in order to kind of support that creativity, we made it completely open and people could jo join yay or nay. Um, but I completely agree with you, Justin, that we need to take into account um, the different and multiple intelligences and, and creativity that our learners bring um, because so many times, you know, they can say so much and being able to um, kind of boil down their responses into the form of a meme or into, you know, a reflection in a ziga. Um, is so much more important and meaningful to them than just the uh, here's a short response, written short response. And, it, and it's clear that your students are, are engaged in this habit of dialogue and, and debate. I'm actually getting uh, hit pretty hard on Twitter right now for my belief. Some of them over something I said a minute or two ago about parents <laughs> who, who choose not to let uh, their kids necessarily engage in some of this networking. And that's fine. I'm not, I'm not saying they shouldn't be. I think that's right. great that um, part of what you're modeling in your classroom practice is that this is what grown-ups do, is they talk about things in public spaces. They disagree. They, they raise points. They, they talk back and forth. I guess I'm, like Justin, I'm continually uh, wondering about this idea that the stuff that our students uh, would say is the, is the engaging learning is the stuff they're doing sort of after or on the side or uh, uh, peripherally. And I, I'm continually curious about how both we mix that so that we can bring some of that engagement back into the classroom, um, but also how we push the, our students out into the world in situations to, uh, to, to engage in learning out there. And it's clear that your students uh, are doing that. And hey, guys, I didn't mean that I don't think kids should be on networks. I just meant that some families, that's, that's a family conversation that sometimes needs to happen. And it's not necessarily the job of a teacher to decide what are all the networks that, are, that their students uh, can and should belong to. Bud Hunt thinks teachers shouldn't let kids on networks. 
more great quotes for for today's webinar. Um, I do want to I do want to think about what is the center of a student's learning experience, both in and out of schools, right? Um, oftentimes, the model that we critique um, is the the sage on the stage model, right? That um, you know that the teacher is the center, and all the experiences come from her or him, and and from that is is how students get banked knowledge that fills them up, right, as empty vessels. A very problematic vision. Um, and Open Networks really highlights that this this knowledge can be distributed, that the edges of where we learn um, can become the robust center as well. Um, and so, actually, I want to think about the role of teacher here for a second, and, and go to Janelle for a minute and think about whose responsibility. Is it is it the teacher's responsibility really to bring in these open networks and and how do you do that if you're a new teacher and you've never done this work what's what are some of the steps that that you've done specifically in your practice here I do think um, just as it is important for classrooms for learners for students to um, um, have this availability and be able to participate in this open network it's just as equally important for educators to also remain openly networked meaning um, if it weren't for Twitter and other um, online presences of uh, various networks, I would not be um, have access to as much professional development. I mean, because if you think about it, Twitter to me is really like professional development, on-demand professional development 24-7. I can choose who I want to follow. I can choose who I want to retweet. I can choose to favorite. So I have this arsenal and this resource ready to go and it's with me and it's mobile. So that's um, one thing. I really think it's important and I do think it's a responsibility, especially in this age, for educators to um, stay on top of that. Um, secondly, I do think that we need to seek out these opportunities to allow learners to participate beyond the four walls. That's the only way that um, learners can really sh look at these other perspectives and that was really something that was important for our classroom and for our learners again because it's um, rather homogeneous and we really wanted to be able to invite um, these other perspectives. Um, that being said once you find these networks and you find these platforms where learners can share their differing opinions um, you look at the discourse online um, the QED discussion boards, you look at the tweets, you look at you know Twitter and Really, the educator is not there. They're doing it themselves. This critical discourse on civic engagement and all these important things and all these opinions about, you know, the government's role in abortion or, um, you know, what is a should we raise the minimum wage? All of this is happening with them as motivators and them continuing to be engaged in these discussions. And once an educator finds networks like these and and finds a way to truly keep the classroom openly networked that's when really the learners can have the focus and take control and really be authentically engaged in that kind of discussion. And I think there's a suggestion in, in some of what you said, Janelle, in part of the teachers making decisions and families making decisions about participation and which networks, I mean, that's, that's a, a graduate seminar in and of itself. Which networks should I belong to? Which ones do I belong to? Which ones did I belong to on purpose? Which ones happened by accident? Um, but I, I wonder about the, um, the other learning spaces beyond the school that can serve sort of as super notes, right? Like KQED in this place is a good example. The New York Times Learning Network. Um, these organizations, uh, I follow my city government on Twitter, uh, the, the police department. I mean, these, these nodes that are sort of super notes in the sense that they're recognized in some way as, as authority or authorities, um, they can really help to legitimize uh, some of these uh, learning spaces by participating in them. And so your point about making sure that teachers are there is important, but I also think that continuing to support folks who are creating opportunities for students, you know, is your museum posting writing prompts and then showing the f the writing on a wall in the museum, is your, is your local dairy taking, I don't know, dairy is a bad example, but um, how do these how do these other organizations contribute to that conversation? And then what other things are they trying to perpetuate in the networks? I remember back on MySpace when uh, Coke could be your friend, um, which is a, which is a whole other mess of of network and and participation and stuff. But I just wonder how we can uh, help legitimize these spaces through the networks that choose or the folks that choose to participate in them. And I, I will say, coffee is my friend in the morning, so I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, but uh, we do have a question from the live stream that I want to just pose to everybody and maybe uh, hear from Justin first. Um, the question is, how can we change the dialogue around online learning from MOOCs uh, to more networked forms of learning? So Justin, as you're, as you're unpacking this, maybe you can tell us what MOOCs are in case people aren't sure that are watching this. 
Yeah, sure. Um, so MOOC is an acronym. It stands for Massive Open Online Course. Um, the history of them is probably important. So in 2008 and 2009, there were a bunch of mostly Canadian educators who got together and tried to figure out how they could offer courses that would be widely accessible um, to people across the internet. And their courses had a bunch of really cool features of them. They, in particular, they used the web as the platform for the course. Um, and people created uh, learning opportunities in different spaces and shared and networked with one another. And actually, these, these original courses that came to be called MOOCs were incredibly networked forms of learning. Um, and they're very odd. They're unusual. If you go and look at them, you will not intuitively understand what's going on there. If you want a little example, go to the website. I'll type it in ds106.us which is a totally amazing learning experience. And when you glance at that website, you're not going to know what you're looking at and not going to make sense of it. Um, and then 2011, there's a guy, uh, a couple of guys, uh, Sebastian Thrun and Peter Norvig, who opened up this course called Introduction to Artificial Intelligence. And their course consists of a series of lecture capture videos and then a series of problems that people can submit. Um, and 160,000 people signed up for this course. And that was sort of the moment that uh, MOOCs kind of captured public attention. Um, and then for reasons not totally clear, and I think are still hard to kind of track, um, the term MOOC gets attached to this kind of course. It sounds right, massive open online course. Anybody could take it. Um, it, was, it was free. It was accessible and so forth. The key, I think, piece here um, is that if you look at the Introduction to AI course, if you watch a lecture for half for, for, for 10 seconds, you're going to know exactly what you're, what you're looking at. Khan Academy, I think, works a lot like this as well. If you watch a Khan Academy video for five seconds, you go, oh, this is a lecture. I know what this is. If you go to one of the problem pages, you're going to be like, oh, this is a random, this is a worksheet problem. I know what a worksheet problem is. When you get a leaf or a reward or something, you go, oh, that's a sticker. I know what a sticker is. Like my third grade teacher used to give me stickers for math class. All of these features are super familiar. The things in education that can scale really, really quickly are things that we're familiar with. Um, and so I think that's one of the challenges to the question that you just raised. How do we, sh how do we shift the public conversation um, about issues? You know, no one is going to intuitively recognize what forms of network learning look like. It's not going to have the kind of recognition. These practices that Joanna and Taylor and, and Carlos and Jacob are talking about, where they're getting online and they're creating Zigas and they're connecting them with other people and they're making these visual arguments to their peers. Um, if you didn't grow up in a network learning environment, you can't pick up and make sense of that as quickly as you can pick up on, oh, you know, this guy filmed a lecture and now I know what to look at, um, you know, and I, and I know what I'm looking at there. So I think, you know, shifting public consciousness um, is, is not going to be by showing people sort of the one great example, you know, broadly, widely capturing media attention. It's going to be through building networks, through building communities of people who, you know, can, ex can slowly expand the familiarity of these unfamiliar practices. I mean, I think, you know, Bud Hunt has been doing that for such a long time. I think that's why the book that you guys wrote and edited is so important, so that people who aren't as familiar with these practices can take a look at them and say, oh, this is what people mean by network learning. This is how I can get my foot in the door. This is how I can connect. Um, but, uh, you know, we're not going to shift public consciousness and education away from the things that are familiar quickly. It's going to be a lot of work to take the unfamiliar and to teach people about it one person at a time, one school at a time, one classroom at a time, one student at a time, one parent at a time. Right. Um, I think that's, that's, you know, really interesting to think about, like, the whole MOOC thing and to, like, shift the public understanding to, you know, I guess accept, you know, open network learning and, like, online, you know, courses and things of that sort because a lot of people don't think about it as, like, uh, like real education, like a lot of people, you know, especially with like online universities and things of that sort, you know, so, um, yeah, you know, a lot of people just, I think just to expose it to the public, you know, like, you know, like advertising it and like putting it in other public schools, you know, like everywhere, not just like in different, like in schools that are a bit different, like, like New Tech High, you know, schools like everywhere, like central high schools and, you know, public middle schools and things of that sort you know, I think once you introduce it, the understanding of it will, you know, be shifted. I think that um, going along with that, um, I, that's a really interesting question on who decides, you know, what learning is legitimate and who decides what um, 
learning looks like. I think that um, part of the issue is also changing that whole safe space. I mean, granted, there are um, issues, privacy issues, and things like that. I mean, we have to be safe when we're on the internet. Um, but in a recent professional development, it was brought up, you know, hey, I would rather them go through these really difficult discussions and sharing their opinions and things like that um, in the safe haven of our four walls. And I just think that that is part of what being an educator in an open network classroom, I need to kind of challenge my learners to do. And I also need to um, kind of model that for others so they can see, hey, part of this openly networked um, idea is being really transparent, not only with successes of learning, like showing the awesome, you know, reflections and the zegas and things like that, but also showing, hey, you know, sometimes our learners say things that accidentally offend people or sometimes they see a comment that they find to be offensive and they openly have to struggle with that. They openly have to say, oh my gosh, I didn't mean that. They have to, you know, it's iteration. It's all about, oh, I'm taking this risk because I'm putting my opinion out there. But this is how you can learn from that. This is how you grow. This is, again, what that discourse looks like. And I think that that's part of changing that public idea of what learning is, is saying, hey, you know, taking these risks and um, having iterations of what learning and understanding and really constructing that meaning can be messy, but when you do it um, also in a public space, it can be so very valuable. Thanks, Janelle. Uh, Justin, do you want to jump in here? I do want to jump in there. One of, the, one of the themes that I think cuts through this and I think Janelle brings that up is that one of the things that Janelle um, affords her students, offers to her students, is trust. And I think when you look at any kind of openness in society, um, you know, whether, whether that's in markets and libraries and in all kinds of other things, you know, a key feature of openness is trust. Um, and that's something that I'm, I think not everyone understands when they think about the importance of technology and education. I think you, you probably saw that quite a bit in part of the, you know, Los Angeles Unified uh, iPad debacle where they gave out a gazillion iPads. Um, and they said, all right, you know, we want to be more equitable. And so what we're going to give to people to make things more equitable is this device. Um, but what students in fortunate circumstances have from their teachers is trust. That's the, you know, it, like giving them devices is, is one thing and an okay thing, but giving them the trust is the thing that really distinguishes the opportunities that people in open learning environments have versus people in more locked down, more teacher-centered kind of learning environments. And that's what we've got to figure out how, you know, even, you know, and, 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 part, and, and trust and openness is sort of, you know, a set of resources that we can use to enrich people's learning experiences, scaffolds and boundaries are other things that we can use at different times to enrich people's learning experiences. We're not talking about sort of throwing the walls off everything, um, but, but one, of the, one of the destinations that we should be having in our schools is getting to points where we say, oh, absolutely, we're going to trust our students um, with scaffolding, with support to be able to, to go out and communicate with other people knowing, as Janelle said, that there are going to be mistakes. Um, but let's have them make some of those mistakes when they're here and with us and where we can take care of them and support them and help them make some sense out of that. Um, but that's really what we need to be able to, to share with our students, that, that you know, a, a vital ingredient of these kinds of open network learning environments is the trust that the people who participate in them are going to enrich the experience for the people around them. I think it's um, sort of interesting when you, whenever you were mentioning the use of, like, like, the use of technology along with trust at uh, New Tech, we have these things. I'm actually wearing one now, which are our trust cards. And whenever we like misuse technology, our facilitators have the power to take our trust cards away from us, and we can get them back by like doing something that fits whatever we did. And adding to that, part of the learning experience isn't just learning the information; it's learning how to be responsible online and building kind of the knowledge of how to use the online world because in the real world you're not going to have those limitations and somebody standing over your shoulder saying this is what you can and cannot do you kind of have to recognize that that is a big part of the learning experience 
I really need a trust card. I need to figure out how to get one of these as soon as possible. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and, and hear, particularly from Janelle and Bud, about how open networks can support teacher professional development and teacher learning communities, um, especially as today's um, webinar and the ebook are, are supported by a network like the National Writing Project. Janelle, maybe you can talk about how it's used in your professional practice as a, as a continuing educator. I think that that's. Um I think it has been pivotal. It has been so important for me to be part of National Writing Project, not just for my writing, but as opportunities open up and as, um, gosh, to be able to go somewhere or even be online and be able to pick Bud Hunt's brain is kind of crazy. Um, people don't get that often. You too, Antero, you're not bad. But um, yeah, <laughs> it's just, I mean, it's nice to be able to find people who are like-minded but with different um, experiences and different contexts and be able to say, hey, we have this that's similar um, about us. And so, you know, systems thinking, yeah, we have this as like our core values, but like, look, look at these differences that make our network even richer and how much that can really impact our, our instruction. Um, I think that that's really important, the fact that we are constantly looking for opportunities, if not for ourselves, then, you know, getting something from another teacher consultant in the writing project says, hey, you know, why don't you try this out, or why don't you check this out, or could you contribute to this book? That's pretty cool, too. I mean, it's not just um, us thinking for ourselves, but for others. Um, so an example would also be with the Do Now, you have the whole... Um, um, opportunities for the learners to participate but also um, I'm serving as a mentor teacher for new teachers who are just starting to use do now in their classroom so that's another way um, to actually grow the network and I think that just as important as it is to kinda take from these networks giving back is equally as important because it will just you know enrich and really help to build my capacity too yeah, I think that's well said, Janelle. I agree. Um, networks, the, the professional networks that I belong to and continue to belong to, like the Writing Project, are immensely valuable, in part because they're an audience for me to, to explore and ask, uh, but also because I, 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 I see different perspectives. I guess more and more, I'm interested in the in the professional development network I'm building for myself, right? My uh, my edu blogosphere, my personal edu blogosphere, right? The, the 15 blogs that uh, are my must-reads, the, the teachers that I found who are very different from me but are excellent at things I am not that I've said I'm going to spend time reading and, and exploring here, the, the folks have said, gosh, these are voices who are just like mine. Sometimes I need those voices to remind me that what I'm doing is, is the thing I actually wanted to do and it really is okay. Um, picking, picking brains from, from other uh, spheres of, of university or, or, or business cultures to, to say, gosh, here's what it's like over here. The, the the thing that I hope our students leave our schools with the understanding of is that they can build their own networks, right? They can construct what they need out of the open pieces that are available to them, be that for entertainment or for political discourse or for, for participatory engagement or, or for learning. Um, and I just, I, I am, I marvel at the opportunities that I have uh, to do that. I, I, I can literally reach out and touch so much of the world and I learn a great deal in the process. Um, just looking at the time, I want to come to a question I saw in live chat, even though this um, this month is, is pretty school-centric. Uh, there's a question in live chat that says, we haven't brought up libraries and museums yet. How can we create open networks between classrooms and other physical learning spaces and then extend the work online? And I think about the work of um, a librarian like Buffy Hamilton, and but I know you've included some museum work in your chapter, so I'm wondering if you can address this question. Yeah, Mike uh, Morosky, I always butcher his last name, but Mike is a, is a he's an educator uh, attached to the Portland Art Museum, and he has a section in the book about museums as physical networks, but also as the people in the museums, um, how they interact with art and, and think about the physical spaces as a representation of, of some of these open uh, digital networks and then how that work can expand beyond the physical space. So um, I think that, that places of learning are, uh, you know, certainly not just schools, museums, libraries, um, uh, civic civic spaces. Uh, we've got an event that we're running next week in our, in our city hall in Longmont where elected officials and students are going to get together and, and argue issues. And, and those aren't typically seen as classrooms, but seems to me that City Hall and our, our school board rooms are, are perfect examples of civic uh, classrooms. Um, one simple way that we can 
uh, build those relationships between schools and those spaces is to like talk to them. I know that sounds silly, but we're in a big a physical library card push in our schools right now. Uh, so it's it's odd, but one of my colleagues asked the other day, uh, people in the school district, hey, how do our students get library cards? And there were a lot of blank stares. We should have good answers to that question. And we should be talking to, to public librarians and museum folks and saying, how do our students engage your space and how do we how do we build those physical relationships? And then we can extend those online. Um, I think the Do Now project is a great example of, of a way that a, a place far away can impact learning in, in our environment in terms of an internet space. But uh, again, go to the go to the places of learning in your community and say, how do my students engage you? Uh, I think that's a great place to start. Yeah. So you know, I absolutely agree with. Everything, but but said, and also just that broader vision that we have so much to gain from connecting the different places and spaces that people learn in, and that we need to, you know, be really intentional about saying like, how do we make sure that city hall and the libraries and the schools are part of that? I think um, having institutions of higher education connect in those ways. Um, are great as well. And some places are well set up with that, and they have opportunities for students to take community college questions and that sort of thing. Um, I do think, actually, you know, that we can that, that for as many problems we might see with MOOCs, they actually do provide a really interesting example of a potentially very multi generational learning experience. You know, on the internet, no one knows your dog, and on the internet, no one knows how old you are. Um, but, you know, especially in learning management systems, which erase and disconnect you from your entire online social profile, which in most place, cases is kind of a negative. But here, maybe there's some some real advantages there. I think you know, if you there 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 are 210,000 plus people who have signed up for an introduction to computer science class course. Um, there are many many people um, who uh, who are interested in learning that material, and people from different ages can learn that material. Um, and uh, and I think it's a great opportunity to say, um, how can we pick some of these, you know, this might be a place to start thinking about some of this. What are some of the things that the K-12 system traditionally has not done a great job of that people have to pick up in higher education? And I would say, you know, two of the most urgent are computer science and statistics. I think, you know, broadly speaking, those aren't things that um, our current K-12 system is super well set up to prepare students well for. Um, and so colleges are putting a ton of work into developing courses to, to bring people into those fields. As they become more online, how can we think about having them be spaces where um, people learn across lots of different uh, environments? I think I think too. It's it's thinking about the nature of the experience we want to have across the network. You you you're mentioning MOOCs again. Reminds me that sometimes a MOOC I've seen MOOCs that are designed as here's a fire hose of information and nobody cares how you interact with it. Right. We need to remind our learners they can pick and choose. But sometimes the the MOOCs DS106 a great example. The connected learning MOOC uh, that uh, the writing project folks did last summer a great example. They're built around doing something together, having an experience, building a conversation. The types of activity that we want to encourage on these networks sometimes is just as important as who's connecting to them, uh, be they young or old or adult. Yeah, kind of going off of a point, um, actually, Johanna and I had our book trailers we made for our semester books. We chose selected by our local library. So now those are out there on the library's website for people to access. And it kind of created, I guess, a place for people to access those and it can ex inspire people to read the book or create their own book trailer. So, right. I think that our school, New Tech, has figured out a lot of things that sort of all this conversation has sort of revolved around. And maybe in the future, more traditional learning will start to start to happen more like how we do things. That's great. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, and so what I'm going to do is ask everybody for our um, our final thoughts for a bit of wrap up. But in doing so, and I'm going to vamp because we're going to start with Bud, so I'll give him a second to think. Uh, in doing so, what I want us to particularly think about is what do we do with this conversation, right? How are we proactive instead of saying, "Oh, that was an interesting conversation. I, I saw something cool today on the internet." Um, what 
where can viewers of this webinar take this work, both as teachers, as researchers, as students, and how can we support uh, open digital networks for learning? So, Bud, what are your final thoughts in just a, a minute or so? Yeah, I'd say that the thing that I hope people are constantly thinking about, be they teachers or students or, or university folks or museum educators or just random, random folks on the street, is uh, what are they doing that might have value to somebody else, and how can they create opportunities for folks to see into that? So it might be documenting your practice and sharing it on the web. It might be uh, taking the stuff that you've uh, hidden behind a paywall or, or under a, a login that doesn't need to be, and, and opening it up. Um, you know, what are the what are the people that you wish your students had access to, or that you wish you had access to, and how come you've never connected with them? Uh, what what would be a small way that you could move forward with a connection, or a way to let somebody, as I call it in the book, productively eavesdrop uh, in into what you're doing? Because I suspect you're doing something interesting. Um, so how can you how can you help folks to see it? The the last thing I would say is um, that I hope we're all being intentional about the types of networks we're building, right? What connections we're making, uh, what we should, what's missing from our networks, a little network analysis, and where we should be uh, where we should be looking for new nodes uh, to pay attention to. Um, I think that as far as you know, continuing continuing you know open. Uh, open network learning, you know, I think we should just continue doing webinars, you know, of this sort, so that researchers can continue to evaluate uh, to, you know, this the whole open network learning concept and the, you know, the whole MOOCs, you know, concept and all of that, you know, and also, you know, just to continue doing, using Twitter and social networking to also, you know, open up the whole, um, you know, the whole, like, open learning, you know, sphere, I guess you can call it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, kind of what Carlos said, um, I feel like that uh, with what he said about having to keep on doing webinars, I think that there'll be always new information and new research to talk about. So you can kind of go off from there and keep adding new information and keep trying to get others, uh, students, teachers, to um, get more like with what we were talking about today. Yeah. Kind of like what I was saying earlier, how a uh, more traditional school, I think, is going to start leaning more towards how we do things more technology-based, and then it'll, like, encourage this whole, like, connection with everyone else and everyone out there. Like, our other school in the district has recently gotten, like, iPads and stuff, so... I think it's gradually going to happen and people are going to, like, this is going to become a bigger thing just by itself. Mm -hmm. And we really, I think the important thing to do is spread the word so that more school districts and teachers can get involved and find these ways for the learners to get connected and to be able to further their learning. And then I guess it'll kind of catch on and everyone can be connected together and share their experiences and learning. Um, for me, as an educator, I think the important thing is is to really just open yourself up and take those same risks that we ask our learners to take every day and realize that um, social media and technology is a great way to just level the playing field and say, hey, you know what, learners, I don't have all the answers, but I know that this is something that you are comfortable with and that... Um, I can really use to leverage the learning of this content and even more skills that go beyond that. So if I can just challenge myself continuously with um, thinking big and finding these networks and these real places where learner work matters and that they can feel like, oh my gosh, there's this authentic space where I can share my voice, then that's it. That's what's going to hook them and that's what's really going to make the learning meaningful and that's what's going to make my design purposeful and it will also help my um, learners to design their own learning. Justin, do you have final thoughts? I would say most of my final thoughts have been covered pretty well. I think the, the key idea is that in these kinds of practices are really unfamiliar, and I and I think um, a great place to start is with teachers and empowering teachers to be really selfish and think about creating their own learning networks, their own environments to help them learn to be better educators or to help them learn to be better at anything else that they care about. 
Um, and it's in those moments that teachers um, are exploring the building of their network when they, and they when they come to their own realization, like, whoa, this would be totally awesome if my students had this experience, or, oh, if my classroom looked more like this, that would be great. Um, that's when I think we've, we've got more teachers hooked and we've got more teachers connected and committed to this kind of work. I mean, there's some stuff that we can do where we say, you know, this would be good for you and you really ought to, tr ought to try it. But I, I think, you know, in the long run, the more powerful place to start is just helping educators, helping all of us find ways of, um, of enriching our lives through the kinds of learning that are now possible and uniquely possible through network learning environments and have them um, be, uh, have great experiences doing that and then find the desire to share that with their students. Thanks, Justin, and thank you, everyone, for this great conversation. Uh, just to wrap up, by tomorrow we're going to have a full recording of this webinar and other curated content. It'll be up on connectedlearning.tv, um, and we hope you share that with your networks. Um, as I mentioned, this wraps up our second webinar of this month-long series. It doesn't mean the conversation has to pause here. I know there are some questions in live chat, particularly around badges, which would just kind of blow up and go in directions we just don't have time for in, the, in an hour. Um, so I encourage you to keep the energy going by using the Twitter hashtag Connected Learning. If you haven't, add to the Where We Learn hashtag um, and get involved in the ongoing conversations with the Connected Learning Google Plus community. Um, join us again next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. That's 11 a.m. Mountain Time for Bud and I, at least. I don't know if anyone else is on Mountain Time. Um, but we're going to be chatting about interest-driven learning through multiple pathways. We're going to have Minu Rami, Cindy O'Donnell, Allen, Craig, Wat Craig Watkins, and Paul Allison joining us. Um, it's going to be a good one. So uh, visit connectedlearning.tv for more info. And again, thanks, everybody. Have a great day.